Jennifer. Kevin Ruzovsky. Welcome, everybody. I think Tom Brady does a hell of a lot better. Let's go. But I have to say, it's so humbling to look out and see so many friends here today that are absolutely changing on so many different levels. This is an opportunity for us really to come together and to make an impact and to really take precision health to the next level. And we know that this isn't going to be easy. There's a lot of folks that might want to stand in our way as we try to really traverse and navigate through all of the opportunities that we see ahead of us. With that said, I would like to go through today four agenda items. First, welcome all of you to Precision Health, provide some perspective and some backdrop to what we're trying to achieve here. Look at the environmental factors that we think do affect our lives every day. Sometimes we understand it, sometimes we don't. We think in the near-term future we'll understand it scientifically at a molecular level. What are those variables of life that we really are trying to measure are particularly important when we look at the most lethal diseases. And then finally, we've created a format over the next two days that's very unique, very provocative, and it's going to give us an opportunity all to learn together to understand and see the promise and the potential that this technology forefront has for all of us as we try to make this a more of a commonplace clinical application. So starting with the vision, if you look at this slide, it to me has stood out for years. And it is basically on the y-axis, it's the life expectancy. And interestingly, Japan and France are both shown here. And what's most interesting is, is that they also have a productive life expectancy that's almost identical to their overall life expectancy. So when they die, they're dying in their sleep very productively. Where other parts of the world are not so lucky. And so when you look at the USA, what you see on the x-axis is just how much money we're spending per person per year on healthcare. There's so much discussed about Obamacare and maybe the next generation of how we're going to do healthcare. But the reality is there's an opportunity sitting in this room to really transform the cost and the effectiveness of healthcare. And we're going to really be working hard at this because we set a vision a year ago that we can have a 40% reduction in our overall healthcare expenditure. We could create access for 60% of the world uh, greater, 60% greater access to the technologies. And then finally, we think we have a shot at, at adding eight years to our overall life expectancy, and those are productive years. And so that's where we're trying to shift this, and it really is in line. We're still going to be probably spending more per person than anyone else in the world, but yet we will at least be on the, the line of trajectory that suggests that we're getting a return for that investment. Digital disruption has been occurring all over the place. Many of you are wondering, geez, is he going to come back out as Steve Jobs this year and give us an update? I almost did. Um, I had one of my top consultants tell me, don't do that again. So I, I listened very carefully. But we did bring Steve back because he did create an unbelievable level of inspiration and excitement around the iPhone. And, and what he was able to do when he came back to Apple was so transformative that over a 10, 15 year period, there was so much innovation that disrupted the world. And all of us are probably sitting here today with some form of the iPhone in our pockets that's probably doing just about everything imaginable. And if we ever lose it, my gosh, it's like, it's probably like the new generation of sickness. You know, it used to be we worried about getting sick inside our bodies. If our phones get sick now, it's, part, it's an extension of us. So I actually was saying the other day that it used to be when you go see the doctor, you'd be like really completely blown away by their, their wisdom and their knowledge. But now if I go into the Apple store and I get the right person, that's the new knowledge. And that's who I really want to make sure I'm close to. What's also interesting is, is there's exponential software that's just transforming every aspect of the world, in almost every industry. And what's embarrassing to me is that this is the industry that hasn't really 
reap the benefits of this incredible explosion of software. This slide just gives you a sense of just how rapidly the billion dollar valuation club is occurring compared to history. And a lot of it is just leveraging software and digitizing every industry imaginable. Our pursuit is how do we digitize and use this to our advantage in healthcare so we can do to our own bodies what our cars have been having done to them for the last 20 years. You pull in, they do a complete analytical analysis. But with the human body, it's so hard. You just never know what's really going on on the inside. You have symptoms, you have things that you think might be telling you that you've got disease or you have health, but just like my cousin, literally 45 days ago, went into the, the doctor with constipation and he is now dead from pancreatic cancer just 45 days later, 65 years old, very vibrant, 25 year old son, to just imagine how rapidly some of these diseases can just overwhelm you, not just him, but the whole family. And all the pain and suffering, it just comes out of the blue without any indication. We need to put that in the rearview mirror. And I know the people and the minds that we've assembled in this room, this was like nothing last year. Bob Stern was mentioning, geez, we put this thing together last year, like last minute. And this year, the people that have come, every single person that I asked to come came to say, I want to speak and I want to push this forward. And I think you're going to see over the next three, four years, this is going to really allow us to transform medicine and use digital technologies. So this is the game-changing technology. I see Dr. David Waltz sitting in the back. He's actually one of the inventors of the Samoa technology. But the ability to detect abnormalities that are undetectable today, measure health to, to disease, that whole continuum, before their symptoms. Early intervention is then av available to us, and even prevention of the disease. Measure the environmental factors and see molecularly what's going on with the way I'm partying or the way that I'm smoking, the way I'm not exercising, the way I'm eating too many growth hormones and sugars and the diets that we have here in the United States. What's this doing to my inflammation in my body? Well, we think that we're only literally months to years away from having those kind of questions understood. So how do we empower the individual to take control of their own health destiny? That's what we're about here, and this is the opportunity, I believe, of our lifetimes. Everybody looks at their generations and say, how are they going to make a mark? It isn't going to be the iPhone. It's going to be what we do for health and what we do for the next generations to come. That technology, by the way, can see the equivalent of a gran granule of sand in 2,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's how sensitive the technology is. And it, also, another analogy that's been used, it can differentiate a single blade of grass in a field the size of Alaska. This is true rocket science that's being applied to the blood. And if you think about the blood, there's six quarts of blood in our body. There's 60,000 miles of vascular structure that those six quarts are pumping through. And every minute, our heart pumps six quarts. So our blood is going through our body 60,000 miles a minute. That is the most incredible Trevor trove of information is found in that, that liquid. We also have three pints of cerebral spinal fluid. Three pints of cerebral spinal fluid surrounding the brain, down in the spine, and six quarts of blood. And there's this thing in the middle called the blood-brain barrier. We've got the experts in the world at this conference, Monet, around the blood-brain barrier that's studying the proteins on both sides and understanding the clearance. Sleep itself might be one of the most important environmental factors. There's a certain moment in sleep that you actually get clearance, and it prevents, we think, Alzheimer's. And some of the most formidable studies are going to be done in the next year just around that concept of sleep and the role that sleep plays in allowing clearance of the bad proteins. How many of you had a dream last night? What I learned last night at dinner, you should have dreams. <laughs> if you don't have dreams, you might have something going on environmentally that could be affecting your clearance. The garbage disposal of your brain and those proteins, they have to get out each night, so try to dream. <laughs> now, urgency. We all know, we've had friends, we've had neighbors, we've had family members sometimes at the age of 10 to 12, get brain cancer and maybe get put down. It's like, how can this happen to a child? Just literally blocks from here, the greatest epicenter of, of medicine in the world, right here in Boston, how can it be 
that a 12-year-old can just be put down because of geoblastoma without any indication that this is happening in the body. These are very significant episodic events that are occurring, but yet there's no indication in the way we do medicine today to see those things coming at a time when we can intervene and do something about it. And that's the key. We're going to actually hear some incredible discussions. We're going to hear MD Anderson stand up and say, we may be able to put pancreatic cancer in the rearview mirror by seeing the disease six to nine months earlier. We're going to hear two or three different individuals talking about breast cancer and the possibilities of replacing the mammogram and seeing breast cancer so much more precisely and accurately to avoid all of the environmental factor of radiation that the mammograms putting so many people through today, which might actually be a trigger for some of the things we're actually trying to prevent. We're going to see so much on CTE and concussions and Alzheimer's and MS and Parkinson's and the ability to see for the first time in blood what's going on with brain health. That's been a big challenge. It's the only organ in the body right now that doesn't have a blood test. Everything else does, but the brain. That blood-brain barrier has made it tough, but with sensitivity and the digitization of what we can do in the blood now, we can see these markers and it's gonna really revolutionize it. But how do we get from the innovation over to the patient? This is a huge, difficult, everywhere I go there's investors there's Wall Street that asks these questions. Well, is there regulatory approvals needed? Because if there are, we're not investing. Do you need reimbursement? Because if you do, we're not investing. The whole patient trials can take 15 years for new therapeutics, and it actually could be a billion dollars, and that could be the same for devices. The current infrastructure is very archaic, especially medical records and that ability to integrate it. And so you have these companies that really go through a whole lot to try to build their innovation and get it to the patient throughout all those things at the top. It's so hard to traverse this and navigate it. 99% of companies don't even make it, and the innovations that they have sometimes are game-changing for the patient, but they just never see the light of day because these challenges get in the way. So we have to break through some of this, and that's why we say it takes a movement. Previous failures can get in the way as well. So last year, I did come out of Steve Jobs, and I did something at one point, and it was really the Theranos effect that I wanted to, how many of you have heard of Theranos? Last year, if I would have asked that question, everybody would have raised their hand, but unfortunately, Theranos didn't put science first. We in Precision Health are putting science first. We've got so many publications that are being represented by the group that's here, and it's peer reviewed. That means there's a devil's advocate of scientists trying to check the science to make sure that what's being presented is as sound as possible. We also got 20 media coming. We're gonna spend time talking to the media. We've heard so much about fake news, but is it possible that sometimes sports writers might write something about CTE or write something about concussions that really hasn't been peer reviewed? It's up to us to not allow bad data to get out and have the Theranos effect where all of a sudden it just collapses on you, and then for the next three years, there's this headwind that all companies have because they say, well, you're not telling us all the story, and as a result, we're not going to invest, or we're not going to allow that technology to evolve. So the Theranos effect is real, so previous failures can get in the way. The resistance to change, there's a lot of profitability entrenched today in technologies that really don't maybe want precision health to win. There's a lot of challenging pieces to the puzzle here. How does imaging stack up? We think the combination of imaging and precision health makes great sense, but there could be some feelings of threats there as well because you might be able to see things in the blood that maybe is better than seeing it through an image, particularly when you consider all the radiation. The food industry with all the growth hormones and the sugars and the pesticides and the antibiotics that they're just firing into our system, 70% of the United States is overweight or obese. That's why we've got so much issue with our life expectancies being so much below the rest of the world. We're addicted. The food industry's done this by design and we're gonna show you that. And these different companies that I've been involved in, there's always some power, there are some egos, and there are different motivations that get in the way of us really moving forward innovation across this chasm. Sometimes the board member themselves think they know it all because they own shares, but they don't know anything about the company or the science or what we're trying to progress. But that has broken so many companies over the years that I've watched, the board itself can just really not be in touch with what it is that's going on in that company. But these are the innovations that we've got to bring forth, and it takes 
a community. It takes investors, it takes innovators, scientists, it takes patient advocates to really ensure that we're moving this thing forward the proper way. There she is. We need to dispel the Theranos effect. Elizabeth Holmes, great person. I think the world of her. Her vision was absolutely, I think, one of the most exciting visions around having in every clinic or CVS or Walgreens the ability to take a little finger prick of blood and to see what's going on in the body. It's just that the platforms needed to achieve that are hard. I know one company that starts with a Q that's invested over 150 million to get to an instrument that's this big, and the new instrument that they got is like this big. So that's a lot of money, it's a lot of investment, it's a lot of hardship, <laughs> it's a lot of people that work their tails off on weekends and over seven days a week trying to get these technologies out into the marketplace so to have the platform that can actually do what she had a vision for was challenging. And I think that when things are too good to be true, that's another big resistance because everyone says, especially those entrenched profitabilities, whether it be the NFL, whether it be sugar, whether it be the food industry, whether it be imaging, whether it be chemotherapy, because there's much better drugs now that can really replace it. But yet, chemotherapy is one of the most profitable drugs almost in every hospital around the nation and around the world. And as a result, it gets way overused. We have had oncologists and pathologists sitting in our boardroom, right, Mark? Tell us we know we're overusing chemo, but it's the P&L for the hospital, and it's hard for us to break into these new novel drugs. So how do we get the patient to get what they really deserve and all of us to get what we really have innovated is not easy. So at this talk or at this summit, we've got 50 luminaries. We've got 5,900 peer-reviewed publications represented by those 50 luminaries. We've got 550 pioneers that are coming to this, which is, to me, a big piece of this. And then finally, I think there's a lot of courage in the room. And I listened to it last night at the table. Henrik, now everyone thinks Henrik Zetterberg is a, is a hockey player. Um, but you're going to hear that he was a hockey player at one time, but he's one of the greatest minds in the world around seeing what's going on in the blood around brain health. And the, the stimulating discussion we had last night at the table just about the future and the possibilities, these guys are courageous, and they're unified. They are really going after this. They're here. They've they got so many things they could be doing. I'm really intrigued with Ragu coming later today, too. He's been on the plane, I think, for two days getting here. He's the guy in charge of uh, biology at MD Anderson that's going to be talking about pancreatic cancer. These people are coming from all over the world. We got folks that came in from California last night to be here to help bring the credibility of what we need in a united front around these, these opportunities. Now, hey, peer-reviewed publications doesn't mean, if it if it's, looks like it's too good to be true, Sometimes that gets in the way. And here's um, a great Joseph Lister, first success in published papers in 1967. This is anesthesiology, basically, and the ability to, to use, um, you know, to keep uh, the bacteria out from surgery. His actual publication was in 67. And, and what is that? 14 years later, President Garfield dies, and they're still not utilizing what he published 14 years earlier for the president. And they didn't wash their hands, and he had a bullet that they were trying to remove. So that's an example where if it seems like it's too good to be true, it can get in the way. And that's why you've got to bring the credibility of a unified front from so many different angles. We've got to groundswell this with all of the science and all of the thoughtfulness, not only of the innovative uh, folks as well as the practitioners, the clinicians, but the patient advocates that are actually looking for that answer. We know Susan Coleman wants an answer to breast cancer, and they want it now. So they're going to watch us very carefully as we try to announce what we have and present our science, because they have a vested interest. So keynote speakers, this lineup, I can't thank all of you enough. These, the, your names have what brought a lot of the people here. I, this is morning, just walking in, people are saying, I cannot wait for this program. This is really going to get to the essence of what I've been feeling instinctually for 10 years. But it's just like, how do we get this moving? How do we really use precision health to really be preventative and trying to prevent the disease as opposed to treating it later? These are the logos of where they're coming from. We have all these featured speakers as well in the logos of where they're coming from. We also have the, the, the press. We're going to do some roundtables at lunch. 
to talk about are they using third-party peer-reviewed publications when they're broadcasting either in sports, the business world, or in the science world. We would like to really discuss this and make sure that we are using them to help us and that we're all on the same team together with our communications. They're not our enemy. The media can be incredibly helpful and we know how successful they can be. I've personally been interviewed probably 150 times in the last year from different journals and it's been amazing, except for one. It's been amazing how helpful it's been to get the story out. And I know that many of the keynotes have feel the same way and probably can add a zero to the number of times that um, the press has been helpful. So we really want to utilize this. Who's here today? 39% are here for oncology. One person this morning that's a neurologist said, I'm not here for oncology. I, I, I hope I don't have anything in me, but I'm definitely not here for oncology. I'm here for neurology. 40%, 13% for cardiac. And inflammation cuts across everything. So we know that that's really all the pieces of the puzzle. Advocates, providers, 3%, 25%. The therapeutic groups, as well as folks that are working on new drugs being moved through the pipeline, um, 45%. And investors, 9%. And the sponsors. No one's paying for this summit. This is free. I've been to summits like this that have cost over $1,000. These sponsors have stepped up. Quanterix is at the top of this list, but thank you so much, sponsors, for allowing this to go. And next year, we're going to start the sponsorship drive early, where this year, I think we started like a month before. I know that there's people that really want to be part of this and make this movement um, a real movement. Acknowledgements. There's so many people um, on this list that have just played such a major role in putting this together, and I just would like to show their names can't really uh, take the time to go through each one of them, but uh, Governor Baker and Governor Deval Patrick both have been very supportive. I think Governor Baker has made this a proclamation of Precision Health Week. So um, he couldn't be here, but next year, I know with the people that we have in the room, in fact, I've already met one or two of them, are gonna make sure that he's, he's here for this uh, next year. Environmental factors and their triggers. So life expectancy is, sh is shorter for our children than we today because we've plateaued on life expectancy. So your child being born today is probably gonna live shorter than you based on the current trends. And by 2030, cancer is gonna be a major uptick. Diabetes is a double digit uptick, $600 million of expenditure. Neuro diseases already are at a major uptick. I think Alzheimer's disease has gone up 89% in the last, 10 years, um, deaths from Alzheimer's disease, 89% growth with a huge surge of elderly uh, moving through the pipeline that's going to continue to increase as medic uh, causes as well. These are things that maybe have some environmental factors that affect them. Let's talk about sugar for a second. Look at the amount of sugar um, that's being consumed in the United States, liters of soft drinks per person per year and then look at energy consumption, which could lead to pollution, which could also lead to us not exercising because we're just like using our cars and things. And look at the obesity and overweight of United States compared to France and Japan, where we showed at the beginning the amazing control they took of sugar back 25, 30 years ago. They almost eliminated most strokes in Japan just by eliminating sugar from most of their diets. There's not very many obese folks in Japan either. So it's amazing some of the learnings of just the simplest little environmental factors. 40% of cancers this past week have been linked to being overweight. 13 cancers are linked to excess body fat. Uh, we, we've known this, but now the studies are starting to come out correlatively. But more importantly, we're seeing the biomarkers that are going to further evidence this. Lifestyle is more important than you may think. 60% related factors to individual health and the quality of life. 41% of Americans would need to have a near-death experience before actually kicking the habit for good, partly because we're addicted. Dopamine is being released each time we're taking the sugar down. It's creating an addiction, and the food industry knows it, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. And then, obviously, the, the cancers and the, relate, the relationships to lifestyle. This is just to show you the obesity just in 1994 of United States um, in the, the amount of diabetes. Now let's just look uh, what happened in the next you know, 20 years here. Um, it's rampant throughout all of the country, both obesity and diabetes. It's just at an epidemic level, but yet it's really not talked about that much. 
But yet, if you go to these other countries, it's like where they're putting their investment dollar to reduce healthcare expenditure. The food addiction is real. 70% of caloric intake is processed food. The bliss point equals dopamine release. And that is something I actually watched them do brain scans when I was in the food industry. They would do brain scans of an index of salt, fat, and sugar. They would get different ratios, and they would do brain scans to see when dopamine was getting released. And that's when they said, that's the recipe for us. And when you say, I can't, only just eat, I can't just eat one, well, it's by design. And, and how insane is this? How insane is this? And it's actually killing people, and it's creating factors that we're going to be learning so much more about now that we've got the tools to look inside of this. Healthy food is not addicting is part of the challenge for profitability of the food industry. There's liking, there's wanting, but then there's needing. And that is the challenge when you have a physiological state and your enzymes start really driving your body to need this. And that's actually by design in the food industry. Subsidies is another policy thing that we've spent time in the past. This whole concept of subsidizing sugarcane and corn, corn syrup, and other countries in France and Japan, they're taxing corn syrups and sugars. We're actually subsidizing their production. It's a free ingredient. 160 pounds of sugar per person per year is being consumed. I would say 90% of that you don't realize you're even consuming it. Just start watching the labels, and there's been a lot of exposure to this. But not only is it the sugar in the corn, but then it gets into the food chain, into the chicken supplies, into the cow, the poultry, and then into the salmon. So they're now supplying this corn downstream, and it's being used with a lot of pesticides, growth hormones, and antibiotics. And when you have all of that hitting a perfect storm, it does lead to omega-6 overload, hormone imbalance, overstimulated insulin growth hormones. These are the basis of the, the big four that we show on the, on the right. Antibiotics in our food, this just came out, I think, this past week, showing where all the antibiotics are in the fast food. It's just we're being, our microbiomes are being basically assaulted by all the antibiotics that are occurring and really affecting our overall balance. And so one thing I wanted to point out is cancer. Lung cancer is still, for males and females, pretty high up. It's number two in both categories, but it's number one on the estimated deaths. So we're not really doing very well with lung cancer yet. Um, pancreatic cancer we know is pretty much a death sentence today. Breast cancer clearly has made major strides, but still a major killer. Um, and we have so much unnecessary pain and suffering occurring with breast cancer. One of our speakers is on this slide. Um, you might remember Bob Stern in 60 Minutes back in the, in the day. And concussions could be an environmental factor. <laughs> I think you're going to find out it's not that they could, there's now proof that they are an environmental factor. Concussions in teenagers are linked to multiple sclerosis risk. This was a report that just came out about a week ago. If you're an adolescent and you've had concussions, you have a much higher incident of a multiple sclerosis. The time to advance head health research is now. High school football game ends after nine players two weeks ago suffered a concussion on one team. They didn't have enough players to keep them on the field. Something's going on when you actually have to cancel games due to concussions and the, the effects of those. A trailer, can we show? Rebecca Miller is with us and she's gonna talk in a moment. That requires Spartan qualities in order to play. And I'm speaking of a sacrifice and not the Spartan quality of leaving the week to die. I grew up in a football family. That guy running with the ball, that's my dad. Good My father could be normal, but he could also be explosive, childlike, or distant, behaviors which grew more pronounced over the years. When he died, they diagnosed Dan with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. I've come to think that the real problem is the movement of the brain inside the skull. The rub comes uh, based on the severity and the repetitive nature. Only people who are close to him will notice subtle but progressive changes in his personality and in his behavior and in his level of function. Head injury doesn't occur to one person. It happens to the entire family. With head injuries fast becoming a greater problem in the sport, how long would it be until they became too high a cost? The percentage of 
concussions reporting is very low. I want to be 75 and healthy if that's possible. I wanted to know if there were other families living with this disease. I always compare it to living with a rattlesnake. He had a constant paranoia. He thought she was going to leave him. My mom was sitting out of the room and she woke up with a pistol in her face. There's so many of them that, that genuinely just need help because it become my soul. The Super Bowl winning safety Dave Durson took his own life. You know, say I was found dead in a Southern California home. I won't remember how a lot of that was ever going to work on that. I'll go back. I forgot. She was able. There's a trend here. There's a trend. There's no question about it. There's a trend. I went on the road to discover what had happened to us because of CTE and discovered my dad in the process. So this movie is going to be coming out on CTE. And so when I talk about patient advocates, get involved. Rebecca Miller will be speaking with you in a few moments. She's the producer in a way of this. And her talents have allowed her to take her film talents into the world of CTE. I'll Be Me was a movie on Alzheimer's that a documentary on Glenn Campbell, if you haven't seen it, it was amazing. Same film crew put this all together. This is what we need to further evidence and tell the stories that are necessary. So our patient advocates that we have at this, at this summit and this movement are people that are really making a difference. And they're getting out there. And they're not basically allowing things to continue without them getting involved and doing their part. Life's variables for the most lethal diseases. I want to show this slide. I've been waiting to show this for so long. But health on the left, stage 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then death. Okay, That's just the, the normal routine of, of your life. Okay, The probability of you getting cured goes way down when you get detected later and later and later. The cost of you trying to get treated to get corrected goes way up as time goes on and you get diagnosed late stage. So the concept of sick care is over on the right. The concept of health care is on the left. We are all about trying to move this industry to the left. And that looks like a fairly simple curve. But now what I want to do is I want to bring another dimension into this, this same slide. And that is invasiveness of the testing that you're doing to get the answer around detection. Biopsies, catheterizations of the heart, lumbar punctures, spinal taps, these are very invasive, very <laughs> expensive, very invasive, and they hurt. Imaging, we know, has a lot of radiation associated with it. And I'm going to show you some statistics in a moment that will just blow your mind. But the blood test and liquid biopsies in saliva and urine are the least invasive. And the reality is that the cost of the bottom left quadrant is nothing compared to the upper right quadrant. How are we doing with cancer? Cancer is primarily a stage 3, stage 4 identification. We've got examples particularly with mammogram and other things that can move it to more stage zero, stage one. But in general, it's a pretty expensive diagnostic. Neurology, a lot of what you're going to hear in CT and Alzheimer's, it's almost posthumous in autopsies. It's almost like you can't diagnose some aspects until they can actually get in there and look through the brain parts. Cardiovascular has moved to earlier stage, but they still got a lot of invasiveness. Infectious disease has done very well, by the way. They have pretty early stage diagnostics, but they also are doing it fairly in in invasively. So the whole point of what we're trying to do is move these disease states to this bottom left quadrant. The protein is something that we think is more phenotypic. And a lot of what you do to your body, we think, gets affected through environmental factors. And these identical twin studies have revealed how one grows up to get heart disease, the other grows up to get cancer, based on the way they live their life, and some of those environmental factors are on the right, the protein ends up being probably more prevalent in the body, maybe a 1,000 times more prevalent than DNA. But it also is a disease cascade that we think is more relevant. So more relevance and more prevalence is why we started with the protein. 
The new instrumentation will actually do DNA, RNA, microRNA with the protein at exquisite levels of sensitivity without PCR. So that will give you the full biomolecular structure that you can look at with your samples, and that, that technology is what's out in the lobby. There's 1,300 proteins that are looked at routinely with today's detection limits, and there's 205 FDA-approved tests, like troponin for the heart is an example. What we've done is change the detection limit to a whole new level, 900 times more sensitivity, enabling another 10,500 proteins to be examined. And that is allowing it to be examined disease states earlier with the sensitivity, less invasively, or lower cost. Inflammation is at the basis of all these diseases, but when you look at oncology today, you hear someone's cancer-free, do you wonder if that's just a, a mere um, essence of the sensitivity of whatever technology they're using to think they're cancer-free? Is it possible that there really is cancer down in there, it's just that you can't see it? Is that the possibility that we're trying to get to? There's 2,100 publications peer-reviewed and 788 markers now looking at cancers, both genes and proteins. The area of neurology, you see the cerebral spinal fluid, you see these proteins going up and down the spine in the cerebral spinal fluid. What's great is a few of them leak across, very systematically I learned, into the blood, and that's what we're actually pulling from to get to the inside information about the brain. 2,400 publications, 150 markers. I think um, Henrik was telling me they're now pumping out 100 publications a year. That's incredible. This is science that is really starting to just take off. And so those that aren't waking up to this, it's going to be just like those that own the rotary phones when the iPhone came along, because we're now moving. Digital technology is starting to have its impact right here in Precision Health. The heart, we already knew about troponin pumping out proteins when you have a heart attack, but can you see the troponin level when you haven't had a heart attack. Well, that's the, the key to our sensitivity. You can see that entire range. You can see it baselines when you're healthy, and any movement from baseline gives you the opportunity to see that movement. And then infectious disease, there's now 256 publications, 800 different markers, and what's really interesting is the cross-involvement of infectious disease with the brain, with the heart, and now we see a whole lot of biomarkers that are starting to teach us the interrelationships of why does someone with HIV get dementia? What's going on there? Why is it that folks that have heart issues have a higher probability of getting Alzheimer's? What are those interrelationships between these organs and these various diseases? For the first time, blood biomarkers are going to allow you to see some of the markers are specific to an organ. Some of them cross over and can teach you about inflammation that's being triggered by another part of the body. So in total, there's 6,000 publications represented 1,700 markers, 1 1.3 trillion cost, 50 million deaths per year. That's how we get the eight years added on in the United States, is by getting to the essence of this. Breast cancer, I mentioned it, this just really frustrates me. Uh, every, uh, in a seven year period, one in two women, or one in two men too now, because there's two folks with, st two men with stage four breast cancer at Dana-Farber right now. The, again, the, all those hormones that we're consuming, all the pesticides, all those environmental factors are affecting men now as well as women in breast cancer. But of one and two are going to have a false positive over a seven-year period. And that's going to put you through a whole lot of extra mammograms, core biopsies, resections. And what you end up happening is 10% per year get a false positive. Of that 10%, only five people out of 100 end up actually having any indication of breast cancer. So 95% go through so much trauma trying to just eliminate the false positive. PSA was something that um, really became popular as a screen, but it's still being used. It's not so good as a screen, but it's coming back as a screen for prostate cancer. But it's actually also being used um, very routinely for whether the cancer is coming back for someone that's had a radical prostatectomy, because it should be zero. Here was NYU and John Hopkins. They had 33 men that had zeros, basically, six months after radical prostatectomy. When you apply this new level of sensitivity, what you found was those 33 men really weren't at zero. Zero's not zero anymore, Brian, right? And what we found is, is that those that are in the bottom left quadrant that had below 0.01 
it's 0 0.01, um, um, uh, so less than 10 picograms per ml, the cancer didn't come back for five plus years. Anyone that was above, I think it's four picograms or 10 picograms per ml, the cancer actually came back within a year aggressively. So that stratification played a major role. Again, sensitivity is enabling those kind of studies. 92% of mild traumatic brain injuries can't be seen with the brain scan. There's 20 million brain scans per year. So many feel that it's often unnecessary given the amount of negatives that we see. There's 100 times more radiation in a, a brain scan than in a chest x-ray. So when you go to the dentist, and my son-in-law is a dentist, <laughs> I wouldn't let them do that brain scan or that uh, dental scan every year. I would try to stage that because there's a lot of radiation occurring in those scans. And again, there's a, so much overuse. And right now we know there's 29,000 from a recent study of brain cancers annually being created because of the overuse of CAT scans on the head. These are important facts that we think should get further publicized. Also, drugs themselves are very toxic, the fourth leading cause of death. And so a lot of the drug companies are trying to use these technologies to get better on-target and off-target engagement, and they're building companion diagnostics to further understand how the drug is interacting with the body. And these five areas that are red, um, we've been actually applying the Samoa technology, and there's 210% prob more probable of getting a drug through if you do, in fact, use biomarkers in your cohort studies, and we're going to see a lot on this, um, in this summit. In the area of um, neurology and Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of work um, looking at blood markers to see Alzheimer's early. We're going to hear from Rudy later today, which is an important area of opportunity. In the area of oncology, we're looking at the, the entire immune system. Can it be digitized with all of these different biomarkers? If you can, you can really avoid potentially the cytokine storms that are occurring with many of the new drugs. So there's $8 billion of research that is going on in building out nucleic acid and protein biomarkers. And there's really no regulatory risk or reimbursement risk in that part of the pipeline. And then I know of at least 1,000 trials that are underway with these biomarkers, either phase two or phase three trials, trying to bring these biomarkers out with the drug so that the patient will have a much better safety efficacy of using the drug. And that's going to lead to a very significant diagnostic and health screens market, whether it's replacing the mammogram, whether it's replacing the colonoscopy, which I think there's still a lot of great in the colonoscopy because it actually uses preventative natures of removing pulps. But these are big, awesome opportunities to kind of further advance. And we just know um, just two years ago when we started PPH, there was a few companies that were using biomarkers um, a year later there was that number, and now this is the number of companies that are using these biomarkers in their drug pipelines. This is an important aspect to showcase the fact that we're really evolving very rapidly in this area. We know that the NFL, there was an article written by Bloomberg, that's the one that I was somewhat questioning, it said, that, will NFL help save the NFL is a good thing, but they also said, or will it be its demise? I wish they wouldn't have just added that part because it just put me up against them in a way that I didn't know it wasn't necessary at that moment. But with that said, NFL is an amazing marker that's been showing um, tremendous opportunity, um, particularly for rotational axonal um, damage uh, across, and that was the TCU. He'll be presenting um, the uh, NCAA findings. Um, also, Tau, um, prolonged return to play after concussion. Jessica Gill is going to be talking about actually projecting now how long it'll take to return to play or return to action if you're in the military and do it safely. Uh, NFL has been also a breakthrough biomarker for Huntington's disease. Um, also measuring the efficacy of MS treatments with biomarkers has been a major opportunity area. Um, this uh, NFL has also now been used with um, Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration in patients and seeing a, a perfect correlation between the cerebral spinal fluid protein level of NFL and blood. It's about 1 100th the concentration in blood that it is in the, in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and that makes it a much less invasive test. Uh, biomarkers in oncology and immune oncology, uh, particularly looking at the immune system and all the cytokines to make sure that we can understand their role. A lot of publications as well on infectious disease and P24. And so in closing, I would like to say that this is a slide that really brings it home. If we can just have an annual physical where they look at our blood 
and we give us a dashboard on all of our cardiac markers, all of our cancer markers, all of our neuromarkers, and all of our inflammation markers to see from baseline how are we traversing and the way we're living our lives. That gives us a look inside of what's happening so that we can really be so much more predictive and then take action. And I think a lot of it's gonna be lifestyle action to get ourselves back onto the road. So in summary, this goal that we have to get United States back into the game with 40% lower healthcare costs, 60% more accessibility of the technology and, and healthcare, and eight years further life, we think is a very noble, very noble goal. So in, I'd like to just move this quickly to the program that we have um, that we will try to debate and collaborate. We're gonna start um, now with a session around CTE and a lot of the concussion crisis. And before we do that, I'm gonna ask Rebecca to come up um, after we show another caption from her upcoming film. And then at 11.15, we'll have a panel that we will also look at Alzheimer's disease and neurodegeneration. Then we'll have the lunch panel that I mentioned earlier, the round table with the media to try to understand the role of media in helping us and supporting the voice that we think is really important. And then in the afternoon, you have your choice, scientific tracks in different categories, ranging from um, CNS to oncology um, to informed decisions with precision health from an IT perspective. So um, great venue for today. Tomorrow's venue is equally good um, in your program. And so what I'd like to do, if I could, um, is if you could cue up the, the Hilton um, part of the video. And these are some of the questions that we are going to be trying to get to over the next uh, two days. So I really want to thank everybody for their attention. And um, before we cue it up, uh, Rebecca, just to make sure you're in the audience. Perfect. Um, if you could cue it up, I would appreciate it.